All right, good afternoon. My name is Leah Rand, and along with Erin Kesselheim, I convene this health policy and ethics seminar. So welcome. Um, very much looking forward to today's discussion on commercialization of traditional knowledge and justice for communities. During the seminar, as you have questions, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen to type in the questions. We'll be having a moderated Q&A session towards the end of the panel, and you, we invite you to follow the Center for Bioethics and other upcoming events. The aim of the Health Policy and Bioethics Seminar is to articulate and understand key and current issues in health policy that are affecting healthcare and public health and how those inter intersect with ethics. And we hope that the conversation today where we're bringing together experts who come with different perspectives and disciplinary backgrounds will stimulate your own thinking and you will leave this session engaging in these ideas and thinking about how you might pursue further work or connections in this area. Our next seminar, we hope you will join us, will be on November 15th at the same time, same place, and we will be looking at access to healthcare for immigrants and migrants in the US. I'm very much looking forward to today's seminar and I'm going to turn it over to our moderator in a moment to introduce our panelists and tee up the session. Today's moderator is Daniel Eisencraft Klein, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics and Law. He previously served as a policy analyst for Health Canada, and he graduated from McGill University and received his MSc and PhD from the University of Toronto, where he was a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council doctoral fellow. So thank you for being here today and over to you. All right, everybody. Well. Uh, welcome to this first health policy and bioethics seminar uh, at the Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Daniel Eisencraft Klein. Um, I'm here at Portal, housed at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, I'm joined by Dr. Nicole Redvers, a member of the Denanukla First Nation in Canada and an associate professor, Western Research Chair, and Director of Indigenous Planetary Health at the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry at Western University. She also currently serves as the Vice President Research at the Association of Faculties of Medicine of Canada and is an adjunct professor at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. I'm also joined today by Professor Angela Riley, who is the Carol Goldberg Endowed Chair of Native American Law at UCLA School of Law, where she also serves as the Director of the Native Nations Law and Policy Center as well as special advisor to the Chancellor on Native American and Indigenous Affairs. Uh, Professor Riley is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation of Oklahoma and also serves as Chief Justice of her tribe Supreme Court. So um, before we begin, I want uh, to first recognize that uh, this is taking place in the context of uh, Women in Brigham's Hospital and Harvard Medisco Medical School, which is uh, located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original habit, uh, inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. Uh, re redressing the wrongs of displacement and disenfranchisement is ongoing work, and today's seminar is just one such effort to increase our understanding of the wrongs done to Indigenous peoples, uh, develop policies that recognize their contributions, and, and ask how we should and can uh, engage in this process. Uh, and I encourage you to reflect on these re redressals on whichever land it is that you are presently on today. Okay, um, a quick note about the structure for today. As, as mentioned, both of our guests will be presenting first and then there's gonna be a quick Q&A portion. Uh, I encourage you all to submit any questions you have, please don't be shy um, and we will get to as many as possible. So before we begin with, uh, begin with our first presenter, I wanna just start by giving some context for our conversation today. We are coming off WIPO agreeing to a pretty groundbreaking new treaty that addresses intellectual property in relation to genetic resources and traditional knowledge. Uh, at its core, the treaty mandates that uh, where a patent application involves genetic resources, the applicant must disclose the country of origin or source. Uh, and in addition, if traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources is involved, the applicant has to disclose the indigenous peoples or local community that provided it. So we want to be clear here on what this does and doesn't achieve, right? Um, first, we want to acknowledge 
just the amount of time and work that has gone into this, into getting us to here. This began in two, the, these negotiations began in 2001. Uh, and also that the, there is a real novelty of something like this, that this is the first white boat treaty to include provisions specifically for indigenous peoples. And uh, the first white boat treaty to recognize the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities to their resources and knowledge. And it explicitly acknowledges their right to uh, participate in the implementation of this agreement. And it's worth keeping in mind that this treaty will, will have to be implemented in cooperation with other relevant agreements, such as uh, the Nagoya Protocol. Uh, so this really does give it some uh, a little extra oomph, a little extra power. But we also want to be realistic um, about what this treaty doesn't do and, and its limitations. Uh, it is still built around concepts that are developed out of a predominantly Western legal tradition. Uh, practically speaking, it is perspective, meaning that the parties will not apply its obligations to, page, uh, to patent applications filed before the treaty's entry into force, right? It, it's certainly not retroactive. Um, so there's a lot more to say here. Uh, so, so on one hand, this is exciting, but it's also a moment to be cautious in our optimism and what about what it means for uh, protecting traditional knowledges. So that's a little bit of um, background, but uh, there's a lot more to say on this, and we are in good hands with our two presenters. Um, so we will begin with Angela and, uh, sorry, uh, with Dr. Angela Riley and uh, uh, Professor Angela Riley, and I will hand it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, Buju Jayak, hello everyone. I'm Angela Riley. It's a it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today, even though I can't see your faces. I, I see that you're out there. Um, I'm gonna start by sharing my screen because I have some slides to um, present. And I want to just um, maybe give you a little context as well. Let me make sure my view here is, sorry. Um, give you a little context also for, for what I'm gonna say today. Uh, I am kind of going to pull back a little bit and give sort of a broad overview of a lot of things about sort of indigeneity in general and with a focus on the United States, but um, most of this applies elsewhere in the world. I've done a lot of work actually internationally and, and also was one of the people who worked on the WIPO project through the Indigenous Caucus, um, most of it with the Native American Rights Fund. So, um, so I'm kind of giving a big picture view. And what I really want to do is try to kind of ground this conversation in Indigenous concepts and in indigeneity um, as I've experienced it individually as a person and in the world. Uh, so um, I'm starting here by showing you um, a photograph. This is the farm where I was raised in rural Oklahoma. Uh, this is actually located within Indian country. This is within the borders of what was the Kiowa Comanche Apache Reservation uh, before it was opened up to allotment and settlement. So uh, in this in this presentation, I have you know, three major takeaways that I want to leave you with. Uh, the first one is I want to highlight and explain that indigenous peoples, and first of all, let me just say a couple of things about nomenclature. Um, in the United States, we still use the word Indian. It's perfectly fine to say the word Indian. Indian is used as a term of art on in many of our like legal concepts. Indian country, for example, is a statutory term. It is a term of art. We refer to Indian country as Indian country. So I use the word Indian. I know in some other places, um, Indian is disfavored and in some places it's just outright offensive. So I just wanted to just note that. I typically use native and indigenous. Most young people today identify themselves primor primarily by their nation or their tribe um, and then sort of indigeneity or native. But I just say that so if you're hearing me say the word Indian and wondering why I'm saying it, that's that's um, it is a term that we do use, especially in law. Um, so in any case, uh, I wanted to just start with a, a few takeaways. First of all, that indigenous cultures are land-based, and that means that the culture, the life ways, the way of being, and what we would consider to put in the bucket of religion, if religion was actually the word that we would use for native spirituality, um, all of those things are land-based and place-based. And this is one of the things that really distinguishes indigenous peoples from all other peoples in the world, um, including other sometimes disadvantaged, discriminated against, or minority cultures or peoples, indigenous peoples have a unique relationship to the earth and a unique relationship to the nation states which have formed around them through the process of colonization. 
obviously this looks differently in different parts of the world and indigeneity can be contested. So I'm not gonna try to make it sound like it's an easy case. Most of my work is in the United States and the other settler nations, including Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And in those places, the um, understanding of indigeneity is fairly straightforward. Um, we were all, of course, colonized by the British, um, among others. So that's the first point, is that we're land-based cultures and religions. The second point that I just want to make is that there's been massive, massive dispossession of our lands, resources, cultures, children, etc., for hundreds of years. And that dispossession, when you're a land-based culture and a land-based religion, means that by definition, you've suffered enormous losses in terms of culture, cultural sovereignty, and the perpetuation of your culture, not to mention, of course, your religious freedom, because you are oftentimes not able to access the places that are sacred to you and to your people. Your creation stories, for example, may have you coming from a place that is no longer in your territory. And in fact, that is the case with many, many, if not most indigenous peoples, certainly in the United States. Um, and then the third point is just to try to draw a thread between this context, between co colonization and the dispossession of land to the present day and the appropriation, not only of land, but the appropriation of Indianness in general, including native knowledge, traditional knowledge, traditional cultural resources, however you wanna define them. And we could get into definitions in Q and A if you want. There are a lot of definitions really working out there, depending if you're working at the national, international or tribal level. But all of those things then have been um, subject to appropriation. And that's the place from which many indigenous peoples begin when we're thinking about what to do, that the do, what to do about the problem, the problem being appropriation. And in some cases, actually non-native people staking ownership, whether through patents or other mechanisms to indigenous knowledge and resources, um, sometimes thereby precluding indigenous peoples from using them themselves. Um, I just wanted to show you this visual. I, I, I feel like most people have seen this, but I always encounter people who haven't seen it and who don't um, necessarily know that for many native people, especially um, you know, from Canada, the United States and Mexico, refer to this land base as Turtle Island. It's referred to as Turtle Island in many native cultures going back you know, to time immemorial. And this just kind of gives you a visual as to, as to why that is. And also shows you, I think, sort of, understanding hemispherically that the borders that separate these nation states are relatively insignificant to Native people, especially to Native people who are cross-border. And there are many cross-border tribes on both our northern, our northern border in the U.S. and our southern border. Um, there are tribes that have um, special treaty rights to move back and forth across the borders, although those have not always been honored. Um, post 9-11, those actually became much more difficult to exercise for some people. And um, during some of the more recent presidential administrations, um, things like efforts to um, build walls, et cetera, have um, put some federal laws in abeyance that would have protected against destruction of sacred sites in some native lands across the southern border. I, I use this quote because I think it um, kind of beautifully encapsulates the point that I wanna make on the first takeaway, which is that the land and the religion and the culture are all one thing. And so it's difficult from a Western perspective where things are sort of siloed off into um, really distinct categories. Um, Native religion isn't doesn't include orthodoxy. It's not about spreading the religion at all. It's really about who you are as a people. And, um, and it's connected to the place where you're from. So the destruction of the natural world or the dispossession of the natural world necessarily leads to this kind of destruction. Um, this map is actually taken from the First Americas, First Americans Museum, which is a new museum that opened not too long ago, um, heavily funded by the Chickasaw Nation in Oklahoma City. And the map shows just one example of the mass removal that happened in the United States. Obviously the Eastern seaboard is sort of a whole separate question, although of course people were still removed from the, um, from the Eastern part of the United States, most famously from the Southeast. That of course is the Trail of Tears um, involving the five tribes, um, most notably the Cherokee to what is now the state of Oklahoma. Uh, you can see up there in the Great Lakes region is the Potawatomi, that is my tribe. And we were removed um, our tribe broke off into different 
tribes over time. And my tribe was removed the furthest until we took our reservation via a treaty in the late 1800s in the Indian Territory, which then became the state of Oklahoma. So this is just, you know, one tiny little snapshot to sort of understand that when we talk about land dispossession, obviously the entire continent was Indian country and was Indian land. And um, the vast majority of that land is now in the hands of non-native people and in the hands, um, not in the hands of tribes. So this is just one kind of visual depiction. I wanted to say a little bit then about the role of law in protecting indigenous people's religious freedom. So again, if you sort of keep that continuous thread and understand that the religion and the culture and the life way and the land are all one thing, and I would include language in that as well, then you understand that the dispossession of the land necessarily means it disrupts all of the other concepts and all of the other things of value. And this is obviously a very long and complicated story that I'm condensing down into just a few bullet points. But the point being here, the reason I'm coming at it from this direction is because I think it's critical to understand the land piece of it. And it's also critical to understand the religious freedom piece of it. So if you are a land-based religion, which indigenous peoples are, and I'm talking free contact people who have not converted to um, another religion, which typically is Christianity in the United States, then your religion is bound up with your place as well. So your creation stories that tell you who you are as a people, that tell you where you came from, that tell you where your holy lands are, those places are here for indigenous people. In the United States, those places are within these borders. And so imagine, um, most of you probably have whether you follow it or not, probably have some religious tradition that you at least know about or understand if not have been taught and followed. And you have holy places in your um, tradition too. And so if you think about where those holy places are, it's exactly the same for indigenous people, but our holy places are no longer in our control um, or within our territory for the most part. Um, in many cases, they're on federal public land. This is actually a photo of um, that I took when I was hiking in Sequoia, the National Forest. Um, and this is you know, a place that obviously was heavily occupied by native people for obvious reasons, rich in beauty, power, sacredness, natural and cultural resources, and now is um, federal public land. And this kind of example plays out over and over again. The um, I'm not gonna get into the weeds on the law, even though I'm a lawyer, I don't wanna bore you with doctrine, but I do wanna just point out a really significant um, set of events that have happened that many people are not aware of, which is that despite the First Amendment and um, purportedly incredibly strong and deep protections for religious freedom in the United States, the United States Supreme Court has repeatedly um, declined to protect the religious freedom of Native people. The most prominent case in this um, sort of landscape is, the, is a case called Ling versus Northwest Indian Cemeteries. It's a 1988 case. Um, and it was a case that essentially said that the U.S. government could build a basically useless road through a sacred site that would completely destroy, in the court's words, completely destroy the tribe's religion. And it did not violate the First Amendment because it was not coercing belief. It wasn't coercing the tribe to believe something that it didn't already believe. Um, the circuit courts have followed along this path. We've had a couple of very bad cases um, out of the Ninth Circuit in the last few years. And so we're all watching these, but I just point this out to, again, tie all of this together, that what's at stake here is not just about stuff. It's not just about land and water. It's about religious freedom as well. Um, the, the land dispossession, we move from that to the concept of cultural appropriation. And this is, um, you probably recognize Gwen Stefani on a horse. And I just I, I just uh, want to direct you here to uh, here here to you a book by Phil Deloria, who's a Harvard professor. Many of you may know may know Phil Deloria, um, who's written a book called Playing Indian. And again, this is really just to highlight that the next step in this journey, that the next takeaway is about cultural appropriation. So once the land has been taken, then the culture is taken. And one of the things that we see happening with Indianness in the United States is the appropriation of all things Indian by non-Indians. If you grew up playing Cowboys and Indians, or you've ever heard the term Cowboys and Indians, or you've ever seen a John Wayne movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is deeply embedded in American culture that once the actual Indians are out of the way, because you need the land, you take the land and the resources, and then because the culture is fetishized, you take over the culture and you play Indian. So you can see how this chain of events 
um, is experienced by the perspective of Native people who are constantly watching this process evolve again and again and again, repeatedly over time um, with regard to all things that are sacred and important to Native people. So with regard to traditional knowledge, we might talk about medicinal knowledge, um, plant medicine. Um, in some cases, the, the references are to um, psychedelics or other kinds of organic substances that are used at, in ceremony and as sacraments. And from your perspectives, um, depending on who's watching this, maybe thinking about the efficacy of the use of these kinds of things for healing for non-Native people, um, for mental health issues, for addiction issues, this is obviously a huge growing field, which is why you have me here talking today. There have been some modest legal interventions that have protected the rights of Native people. There are particular protections, for example, for the use of peyote by members of the Native American church. So it's decriminalized for that purpose. There are some other cases for other indigenous groups, not all of which are from the United States, but who now reside in the United States to have access to various things like hallucinogenic tea or other things that are used in religious ceremonies. We have particular protections for the use of eagle feathers, um, because as you know, of course, they're protected, but um, Native people can have eagle feathers for ceremonies and for regalia and so on. So there are some modest legal protections, but they really don't go very far. And they certainly don't do anything to allow tribes access to sacred sites or to be able to reclaim their sacred lands. I'm not going to talk too much about this. I want to just kind of point out that you might be thinking, well, isn't intellectual property law out there and doesn't it do work in this area? And the answer is, of course, it's there. It does very little work to protect Native people's traditional knowledge for lots of reasons that I could get into if we want to talk about it in the Q&A. Um, an antidote to the imperialistic U.S. intellectual property system has been the WIPO project, and, um, and my colleague is going to speak more about that in a minute, so I won't say too much about it, except also to just, you know, also add that the, the WIPO treaty has absolutely no um, ability to do anything unless it's implemented at the nation state level. So the United States would have to actually implement WIPO and the United States is not going to implement WIPO. Um, and I, I don't wanna be overly pessimistic, but um, the pharmaceutical industry, et cetera, is too powerful. And um, the United States in these negotiations, from my perspective, always made very clear that, um, that the idea of implementation and certainly implementation at the level that many native people wanted, revocation of patents, for example, that have taken without consent um, traditional knowledge, um, is a non-starter. And patent revocation didn't end up in the WIPO treaty anyway. So I'll leave that to my colleague to say more about. Um, I'm going to skip this story. This is a, a something about my own tribe that I'm going to pass because I don't want to take up too much time. I just wanted to close with this um, sort of closing statement, which is that, again, for Native people, almost every Native language that I've encountered, and I've worked with Indigenous peoples all over the world, so I don't mean to homogenize or essentialize Native people, but there are some common features of indigeneity for people that I've worked with from Brazil to Oaxaca to you name it, um, all over, is the land-based, the communitarian collective-based, and also all languages have a phrase for something along the lines of we are all relatives. In Potawatomi, that word is jaganaganon, and it literally means all my relations. And that is just to say, we are all related here. All of us on this Zoom or on this webinar, um, the two-legged, the four-legged, the Longhorn Mountain, which is the mountain that where the Kiowa um, gather cedar, which is just across the farm from the first picture I showed you. Um, we are all connected in this. And so I am, I'm delighted to be here and be able to share this with you today. So jaganaganon, thank you. Um, and I'll close and turn it over to my colleague. Merci. Thank you, uh, Angela. I appreciate that. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm just going to go ahead and share screens. So just bear with me for one moment while I get that situated here. And uh, uh, really happy to have the conversation today. It's really important uh, uh, for me, at least uh, the way I've been taught, to situate myself in terms of my community. And, and part of this positionality, this relationality, comes back to exactly what Angela was talking about. We, we say Salotina which is all my relations, Salotina. But in essence, all our relations come back to the lands that we come from. It's not only, a, a, again, a, a, about positionality, but in my mind, it's about accountability. And uh, therefore, 
I situate myself uh, as a member of the Dene First Nation, which is in what we call Treaty 8 territory or Dene Day, land of the people, which is located in the subarctic region of Canada, but have had the pleasure and privilege and honor of being able to work with elders past, present and future uh, in uh, many varied settings around the world. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit in terms of this conversation, just given the fact that, you know, there may be varied awareness around this topic area generally, and, and really ensure we un understand some of the context to situate the, the discussion to come. And, you know, Daniel had given a, a brief introduction on the WIPO uh, treaty that has recently come out in 2024 and highlighted, of course, that this has been a long effort, you know, 25 years of work that originated out of Colombia, actually. And some of the working committee groups have been, you know, really... Um, putting a lot of effort in, in terms of this momentum that has uh, resulted in this treaty. And, and really, it is a symbolic uh, outcome in my mind, uh, modest in terms of its, uh, you know, potential for operationalization, but, but really symbolic. And, you know, we need to be clear that this is really an administrative treaty. Generally, it's designed, of course, to enhance some level of transparency within the patent system as a result, or as regards to uh, being inclusive of traditional Indigenous knowledges, uh, as well as other components. And, you know, unsurprisingly, Angel alluded to, uh, there was pushback uh, on a number of provisions from certain state actors throughout the process, which led, in my opinion, to a large number of gaps within the Treaty for Indigenous Protections, particularly at the international level. So, you know, very little teeth in regards to um, what that actually means on the ground for protection for a, a specific Indigenous community, you know, located in uh, Africa or Asia or, or any other country for that matter. And one of the things that I think is, is really important in the context of this is that Indigenous knowledge is, you know, if, if a company is needing to report the community of where that knowledge is coming from as a result of a commercial application for patent or otherwise, there is no need or demonstration for that entity to be able to demonstrate that they've received free prior and informed consent from that respective community. There's no need for proof of any benefit sharing as a result of the filing of that patent. And then as Angela noted, no real repercussions for false reporting um, because it doesn't include those provisions for revocation of a patent where somebody has had some sort of fraudulent intent. Now, the other thing is that you know, potentially this exposes a company uh, or entity to public shaming as a potential deterrent, but we've known historically that this really is not a deterrent when it comes to large amounts of money, um, you know, being enhanced. Whether or not this plays out is, is really hard to say at this point, just given, you know, we're so preliminary in terms of the onset of this treaty. The other thing that I think is really important to note is that uh, some countries and regions around the world have already had disclosure requirements within their domestic patent systems, which are aligned in some cases with the commitments um, under things like the Convention on Biological Diversity, which I'll touch on uh, slightly uh, shortly. And one of the concerns around the new WIPO treaty is that because it's less stringent than some existing country uh, patent systems, whether or not this international mechanism will uh, require uh, um, those countries that do have existing rules to actually downplay or reduce their local laws to align with the treaty sign on and, and you know, understanding that this treaty is not as stringent as some of those rules. So that is a concern in, in my mind for certain country contexts. Now, under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, why does this matter? What is free informed consent, prior informed consent matter? And for those that are unfamiliar, UNDRIP uh, is one of the primary human rights instruments for Indigenous peoples uh, around the globe. And it really is a comprehensive international instrument on rights. It establishes a minimum set of standards for survival, for dignity, and also the well-being of Indigenous peoples of the world, and really elaborates uh, on existing human rights standards that have exists, existed for other peoples with fundamental freedoms, again, as they apply specifically to our communities. 
Uh, free prior informed consent is a specific right that is guaranteed or granted to Indigenous peoples that is recognized uh, within the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. However, I want to be very clear that the operationalization of both UNDRIP and FPIC, or free prior informed consent, really varies depending on the nation state around the world. FPIC does allow Indigenous peoples, when respected, to withhold or withdraw consent at any point regarding projects, impacts on the territories, or in this case, in regards to Indigenous knowledges. And it also allows Indigenous peoples to engage in uh, negotiations to shape the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of, of projects or processes. So. Uh, Overall, you know, free prior and informed consent found throughout the declaration, uh, emphasizing this recognition of rights, meaningful participation, which we did see some level of within this WIPO treaty. However, again, uh, very much varied in terms of how it operates on the ground. In fact, FPIC is not really a, a mechanism that's utilized uh, within the United States, but Angela can probably talk about that more. Now, one of the things th that needs to be clear is that although there's preamble within the new WIPO treaty recognizing UNDRIP, the treaty itself is not actually aligned with UNDRIP. It doesn't provide any provisions for uh, being under UNDRIP or even for free prior informed consent. So in my mind, it was you know a bit interesting of the recognition, but really not uh, aligning with the, the existing human rights instrument. There's a few other components, I think, that are really important to understand this landscape. One we've mentioned a few times, which is the Convention on Biological uh, Diversity. And in fact, the WIPO Treaty uh, specifically defines genetic resources in terms of its definition in line and in a manner uh, that is understood under the Convention on Biological Diversity. So there's a, some alignment within these mechanisms. So that means for the purposes of the treaty, it does not include human genetic resources, for example. And we're situated within a health conversation today, and I think that matters it needs to be clear because there's been a number of uh, cases recent and historical where uh, um, biomaterials has been used without consent uh, from patients or otherwise and used for commercial purposes which is a very real and ongoing risk within indigenous communities and it's also important to note that the united states is not currently a signatory to the convention on biological diversity which has impacts for considering what benefit sharing might actually mean in the context of Indigenous intellectual property. Uh, and the reason for that is because the NIGOA protocol on access and benefit sharing, which is another international instrument, actually sits under the umbrella of the CBD or the Convention on Biological Diversity. So NIGOA is probably one of the few instruments which really specifies out clearly uh, the aims of sharing the benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources, which is used in a very broad definitional way. But this protocol also uh, applies to traditional knowledge, including uh, traditional Indigenous knowledges associated with genetic resources. But again, if you're not a signatory as a nation state to CBT, then therefore you're not a signatory or pr uh, privy to the Nagoda Protocol in terms of the way that your systems operate. And again, just to be clear that the WIPU Treaty, although has reference to the Conventional on Biological Diversity for definitional purposes, is not aligned and does not provide provisions for benefit sharing for Indigenous knowledges related pursuits. So on the ground, what does this mean? And I wanted to bring in a health example. Um, we recently, a few years ago, had done a review in the context of the commercialization specifically of biospecimens from Indigenous peoples. And, you know, the review highlighted the crucial need, unsurprisingly, to keep Indigenous communities at the center of projects, ensuring any benefits, advancement, and potential commercial profits are returned communities through clear and ethical agreements. However, there was a number of clear uh, uh, themes that had come up through the existing literature that was really highlighted through a number of uh, Indigenous communities. And I want to highlight just a few of these because I think they're really key in considering this topic area. One of them is exploitation through, you know, what is sometimes 
called biocolonialism. I've heard it, uh, you know, a term biopiracy. Of course, this is specific to biomaterials within the health related or medical fields, although arguably colonialism could be termed eco-colonialism, you know, whether it's lands, resources or other things that are being exploited. And, you know, this is really the act of gaining access to biological material, whether or not it's an academic or commercial benefit, you know, that may be derived from accessing that from a respective community, you know, from a um, from a location organization without the intention of fair compensation to the peoples or nations from whose territory the material originated. And we've noted a number of examples where Indigenous peoples have been subjected to blatant exploitation, ranging from the unsolicited use of traditional knowledges for commercial purposes, also the extraction of traditional Indigenous med uh, medicinal plant knowledge from modern day pharmaceutical development. In fact, a very large percent of our current uh, pharmaceuticals are derived from uh, plant-based materials that were used uh, by Indigenous communities uh, for time immemorial. In fact, it led to the almost extinction of some medicinal plants, including some uh, uh, used for breast cancer treatment uh, from trees along the west coast of the United States. Now, there's also uh, uh, examples of extraction of very genetic materials for medicinal purposes. One recent example has been the collection of stool samples from indigenous communities worldwide for the purposes of research, but also for commercial benefit in the making of probiotics or other kinds of materials that you can often find at the drugstore. Um, and a lot of this history of, of clear exploitation has really given rise to hesitation and environment of a lack of trustworthiness uh, in participating in any sort of medicinal health research projects, uh, but more so, of course, for any projects that relate to commercialization. In fact, we even found a published reference uh, of Indigenous peoples being framed as gold mines for commercial benefit without really any clear intent of actual defined benefits for and by Indigenous peoples themselves. So it's really important, I think, to be clear that what we actually frame by commercial benefit might mean something incredibly different for Indigenous peoples, it differs substantially, that is, uh, to what a commercial benefit might mean for a corporate entity. Um, the other thing that was, was clear is that you know, this idea of exploitation as a form of colonialism, you know, a lack of transparency on benefit sharing, the commercializations, in this case of bio specimen samples, really was a concern. And in fact, it was leading to um, very valid consequences within, uh, you know, even potential benefits that could arise from communities for participation. The other thing I want to uh, highlight as well is that uh, this idea of sovereignty and Indigenous rights has been a, a large discussion within research and health research generally, you know, allowing uh, projects and processes to be really driven uh, by communities, which could include in this case, uh, you know, opportunities for benefit sharing or, or community driven commercialization within a respective community. And this Indigenous sovereign control of research and business processes ensures clear, clear Clearly, you know, a level of defined partnership parameters rather than parameters being developed by a colonial or paternalistic, uh, you know, relationship where researchers or other corporate entities are controlling uh, profitable opportunities at the behest of the communities themselves. Now, in terms of the you know, private and commercial agendas uh, are often viewed to overtake and potentially cloud public or community uh, interest, further increasing, you know, some of the growing health disparities amongst Indigenous peoples where, you know, benefits could potentially arise. And again, many of these stem back from past exploitation or unfair commercialization of Indigenous communities, uh, knowledge uh, or materials from the past. So really ensuring proper protocols uh, you know, equity, justice, and, and sharing of profits really was stated to begin with continuous communication, uh, free prior informed consent, direct partnerships, uh, and, and really ensuring co-led systems are in place to equitably return benefits to community while leaving clear options to opt out or reject uh, any sort of commercialization process uh, seem to be a way to help alleviate some of the concerns. And then the last category, which is part and parcel with the WIPO Treaty is the patent considerations and some of these ideas around a benefit sharing. And, you know, it was questioned quite often whether or not the act of uh, patenting uh, directly 
violated actually inherent sovereignty held by indigenous nations, the very act of patenting being a violation of, of sovereignty. Uh, one of the global uh, south issues that were arisen from indigenous communities in one region was regarding the use of patents that could be uh, um, could result in commercial products actually being sold back to low income countries or the communities at price tags that they might not actually be able to afford while generating greater profit for commercial entities. So this idea of selling Indigenous people's knowledge, medicines, and resources back to them has really uh, caused stress in some communities, expanded warranted feelings of a lack of trustworthiness and increased hesitation. So overall, you know, there was an encouraged note uh, for all research institutions, uh, but also corporate entities to really reflect on ethical uh, process as a part of these, uh, considering collective needs and that benefit is not defined in the same way across uh, communities, uh, particularly when we start uh, crossing into varied regions around the world. So, so why this background? Uh, you know, why the consideration of WIPO, but uh, why the consideration of UNDRIP, free prior informed consent, uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, and the, and the NIGOA protocol in regard to benefit sharing? And the recent WIPO treaty covers a very, very, very small portion of the consideration around the potential commercialization of traditional knowledge. In fact, we can see here, you know, patent considerations are just one very small part of, of a large context and landscape uh, that really is much more complex th than just thinking about intellectual property itself. So there's still many, many layers that leave large gaps for indigenous community protections at the international level, but even at the, at the national level. And just to sort of, you know, summarize, I think, with a with one last point, is I've heard from many Indigenous communities the outright rejection of colonial patent processes or considerations around uh, intellectual protection for Indigenous traditional knowledges. And I think it's important to, to consider these views as well as part of this conversation, particularly where we have settings, you know, in the United States, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, for example, settler colonial states, where we are talking about nations within nations with established treaty systems in place that intersect with, you know, regional, so in the U.S., you know, state and federal laws, but also, you know, um, being a little bit displaced from the international context uh, with uh, the United Nations declarations on the rights of Indigenous peoples and some of the other international mechanisms that exist as well. So you know, a lot of room for additional complexities and, and really appreciating and understanding that this is not a simple conversation, uh, that there are going to be differences in opinions across Indigenous nations, but ultimately at the national and global level, we continue ha to have significant problems around uh, Indigenous knowledge protection. Uh, we have a significant problem in terms of uh, exploitation, uh, uh, commercial um, exploitation specifically, uh, and, and I would arguably say very uh, highly within the health and medical realm generally. I'm sure we're going to have great conversations, but want to end it there and uh, um, looking forward to the discussion to come. Masi Cho. Thank you so much, Professor Redvers and Professor Riley. Um, we're going to get right into it because we don't have that much time, but I encourage um, all attendees to ask, uh, to continue to be asking questions, and I will try to cover as many as possible. Um, I'm going to start off, though, because speaking of um, Speaking of colonial patent systems, or certainly Western patent systems, uh, the three of us have discussed this a bit previously. One overarching tension in my mind in particular is how intellectual property laws generally treat knowledge as a discrete asset that can be owned and uh, uh, controlled independently of the people who hold it. But obviously that approach doesn't align with the way many indigenous communities generally understand knowledge as something quite uh, uh, entangled with community and identity and, and cultural practices. So it feels like, uh, it feels really easy when we're having these conversations to recreate this binary, it, or, or maybe more of the severance, wherein one can cleanly separate Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous people. Could you, whoever wants to take it first, could you perhaps comment on this and what it would look like, what it could look like even to truly recognize the two as um, inherently impossible to disentangle? 
Well, I'm happy to I'm happy to jump in and just give a couple of thoughts here. Um, I mean, I think, you know, that's one of the reasons that I really wanted to start with the land and the people and the place and all of it, because it is all one thing. And the knowledge is um, inextricably intertwined with the way of being in the world. Um, it, it's not. I think one big disconnect between indigenous traditional knowledge um, using that broad umbrella and like the Western IP system, for example, is that our, our system is set up to incentivize innovation and creation. It's set up for a market economy and it's worked very well for that purpose. But intellectual property doesn't isn't created in indigenous communities to be commodified. That's not the motivation for it, whether you're talking about something that would cross a, a patent or a copyright or whatever category. So the motivations are completely different and the objectives are completely different. So therefore, the same system isn't going to produce the same kind of, um, you know, produce the same kind of behavior. And it's a mismatch when you talk about how to protect. I think it's a complex question. I'm sure there's I want to give other people a chance to talk. Um, but I, I would just say, you know, one other thing that we haven't I haven't said in my presentation that I just want to focus on is that from my perspective, it all really comes down to self-determination, which is the right of the people to have a legitimate, informed, not just FPIC, but have say over what happens to them, their resources, which begins with protecting people in place, particularly as we see people being settled all over the world, the Amazon basin, I could give you a hundred examples that people have to be protected in place in order to protect the knowledge. And then it's really about self-determination, what they want and how they want to engage in and with the system. And it will not be uniform across groups. It will be different. And we that's part of respecting the peoplehood and the nationhood as well. And I'll defer to my colleague to respond. Yeah, I, I think you did, you did a great job, Angela. I, I don't really have too much to add to that. I'll also just add, Professor Riley at one point mentioned that successful consultation in the U.S. generally happen when it does happen, which is rare, it's despite the law rather than because of it, fortunately. So um, maybe making a distinction between the nation, success around in nation states versus success at an international level is something we want to continue to keep in mind. Um, one of the questions that came into the group was is quite specific. I don't know if you want to comment it um, in the specific case or more generally, but I think it, it's a useful place to uh, put this these questions maybe into practice. So um, this person asked, uh, increasingly healthcare institutions are in possession of huge quantities of health related data and biospecimens opened in the context uh, obtained in the context of the provision of clinical care. They often wish to use these materials. Uh, bracket in de-identified form for secondary research, which is sometimes with commercial companies. They may not necessarily know which materials belong to Indigenous peoples, but even if they do, they may not know who should be approached for consent. How do you think they ought to proceed? Should, at a minimum, Indigenous representatives be included in data governance slash biobank decision making? And how do they, and really we, address the challenge of engaging the diverse communities that may be implicated? And I would I'd note here, this may be isn't only a question around indigenous peoples, but we could, but let's keep it there and then there are implications more broadly. Yeah, I, I can broach this one. I think this brings in elements of indigenous data sovereignty. Uh, generally, I think, which is a key concept that's been increasingly talked about, uh, and also recognize that the United States has one of the first Indigenous-led biobanks uh, in the world, uh, located in South Dakota, which has really garnered some interesting examples of how these kinds of processes are being looked at from an Indigenous standpoint, because it's incredibly complex. You know, arguably, if we looked at it at face value, that would be a violation of uh, self-determination and sovereignty from an Indigenous perspective. Perspective. Uh, we've had cases even particularly within clinical trials that we've uh, run and been involved in where we have specific mechanisms where uh, blood samples are actually able to be picked up after their use by Indigenous community members if they choose to do so in uh, in the respect of enhancing uh, trust building so that you know we're, we're not able to use those materials afterwards in any way shape and form but also at the same time that there's a, a clear uh, intent when somebody is providing providing a blood sample or doing it, what happens with that after, uh, you know, the cases, what, what happens afterwards? 
regardless of medical use or, or otherwise. So that's really a structural issue problem on many levels for the protections of people generally. And it has led to some serious violations in some cases of commercial entities gaining access to cellular material, for example, from people without their consent and, and garnering huge profits. So large issues, but from an Indigenous concept, context, that would be, you know, in my mind, a violation of self-determination, um, very, you know, at the plain, plainest level. Can I put, can I double check? Have you seen examples? Sorry to interrupt, Professor Riley. Uh, just to, uh, have you seen examples where Indigenous representatives are directly brought into data governance decision making? Well, I would say that's rare, um, although it is increasing in, in certain areas. For example, we've uh, had uh, examples with the Seattle Indian Health Board that's been very progressive in terms of their, their data sovereignty and working with health and public health systems, particularly around making sure that Indigenous peoples are actually collected as a data demographic and not in other category, because that's our main mm -hmm. barrier right now is that, you know, we're often plunked into other or, you know, the racial designation is not collected at the intake of a hospital hospital or, you know, in a medical file generally, and, and there's been efforts to try to improve that. Uh, we've done much better with, you know, our, our Black colleagues around that within hospital settings, but very, very behind in terms of uh, collection of racial data for Indigenous peoples at the medical system level in the United States and, and everywhere, frankly. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to make a couple of points that might be of interest to your audience in particular about the gathering of the research. Um, the um I did I wrote an article recently and I can provide the citation if people want it um where I looked at all of the cult cultural property laws of the 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States and one of the categories was data sovereignty and it repeated a study that I did in 2005 and in 2005 data sovereignty wasn't even a term at least I had never heard of it and by the time I did it in 2020 48 tribes have their own tribal laws on the books to protect their data sovereignty so you can look at those and they're cited in the paper if you want to see what tribal laws look like and their own conception of protecting um, of data sovereignty. And the other thing I would just say is a lot of tribes now have their own internal review boards as well. So if you're collecting actual things related to Indigenous peoples as Indigenous peoples per se, like let's, let's say at the tribal level, um, you would go through a formal process and through the tribal government. So that's one, you know, kind of mechanism to um, to deal with it. Um, many people are probably aware of the of the Havasupai case, which happened, um, you know, quite a few years ago at this point. And I won't go into all the details, but it was a case where ultimately the outcome was not dictated by law. The law really failed to really dictate an outcome in that case. But the tribe ultimately prevailed in part because of the enormous um, importance of doing research with and around Indian tribes in the Southwest. And it involved both the University of Arizona and um, Arizona State to various degrees. So so another issue here is the law doesn't always do the work, but um, but just the the PR piece of it, not to mention just, you know, the good relations in terms of moving forward with research to benefit all parties is such a critical piece of making sure that you have consent and transparency. I think there's something here to pick up on. So we're getting a number of questions. I'm going to try to combine them a little bit, but I think there's something to pick up on in terms of We've been using the term uh, IP a lot, and there's a couple questions that basically ask, to what extent do the same IP issues impact other, quote, soft IP rights, non-patent, but rather trademark, copyright, trade secret uh, of Indigenous people in a commercial context? And they use the example of product sales on reservations within the tourist trade. Could you comment on that? I know, you know, we were careful with nomenclature here, so, um, but I think we've been using IP quite specifically. But uh, do you have thoughts on soft IP rights as well? I'm not sure I totally understood the question. I apologize. It, was it how is IP working in Indian country? Oh, I can't hear you. Apologies. Yes, um, but specifically um, non-patent uh, trademark copyright trade secrets. And, and the example was product sales on reservations within the tourist trade. And um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are a few legal interventions here that are really interesting. A lot of people aren't really aware of them. One of them is the existence of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. So the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, which was originally passed in the 1930s, when um, Native people in the U.S. were, for the most part, very tightly re re reservation bound and very, very poor. Um, and the United States recognized that there was an enormous amount of 
jewelry, pottery, rugs, incredible what they call arts and crafts, which today I would say much of it is fine art, really, if you could see how it's made, it's amazing, um, was an enormous revenue generator. It's what a lot of tribes, particularly in the Southwest, were using to just really survive. But there was an influx of, um, of you know, false products from elsewhere. And so it was a part of that, the um, Indian Arts and Crafts Act was passed, which is or works essentially like a truth in advertising almost like a consumer protection law. So you can't, for example, say that you're making Potawatomi earrings unless they're actually Potawatomi, meaning the artisan has to be Potawatomi. And there's some nuances to it and there are gonna be some new regulations out, but that's one of the features that's really unique to Indian country is the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, which people aren't necessarily aware of. Um, but there's a lot of work, I've written a lot um, on this topic and a lot of other people on this um, threading the needle between, a, on the one hand, understanding and critiquing the extent to which intellectual property law has failed Native people, if not completely, um, not harmed them in many ways. So you have that on the one hand. And then on the other hand, you have many Native artists and even tribes who want to enter the marketplace of creativity, whether through patents or copyright and, and other creative works. And so people like me are trying to kind of unpack that and help um, guide in a way that the existing IP system benefits Native people, should benefit Native people, just like it benefits everyone else. And that, that shouldn't be exclusive of the fact that traditional knowledge and other things can still be protected. The two things can exist in the universe at the same time. And it's it's somewhat challenging, but it's actually not that doctrinally complex. Um, I'm working on a trademark paper now, actually, that will is using, using U.S. patent and trademark data um, for the first time to kind of unpack some of the trademarks out there. Um, so that'll be forthcoming, um, but it'll probably take me a while to get that one done. <laughs> um, Professor Redvers, if you don't want to comment, I actually have a question specifically for you, um, but- Yeah, uh, go ahead. So this is because we're running, we're sort of nearing the end. I want to talk a little bit about something that we feel is coming, which would be the growing attention on psychedelics. So this is something of interest, um, I think, especially to bioethicists. Um, but more generally, there's this question on, th there's a real effort to try to avoid what we are calling psychedelic exceptionalism and rec recognize that often the issues with psychedelics are just microcosms of broader phenomena. Um, and in this case, the broader phenomena of commercialization of indigenous knowledges. On the other hand, there's a sacredness to psychedelics, to certain psychedelics, that is distinct. And Professor Redvers, I know I, I was I saw in one of your papers you spoke about psychedelics as quote not just uh, not just sacred to your community, but as family members. Could you touch on that? Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a key topic right now. In the last uh, year, I don't know how many times you know I've been reached out for from both commercial entities, but also through policy organizations as governments are grappling with even the legal ramifications of how to be able to think about these things in the context of respecting indigenous rights, um, you know, within some of the public health recommendations specifically. But, you know, for us within our traditional medicine um, systems, all, all of the agents that we used are looked at as, as family. And it really goes back to what Angela was talking about before, you know, our concept of Salotina, we are all relations with that. And, you know, if we take that from a basic scientific point, if we were to put on magic glasses and, you know, go to the molecular level, we would look all the same in some ways. But, you know, these interconnectedness of, of our relations are, are so fundamentally important that, you know, would you patent your mother? Would you patent your sister? Would you patent your brother? And and that's kind of how these things are looked to. It is such, you know, an aspect of respect um, and honoring of that of that sacred element that has been embodied and intertwined within our cultural practices for millennia, with a very deep appreciation and an enormous amount of traditional po protocol that surrounds that relationship with that family member, that medicine and family member that when that starts to get disrupted it's like somebody hurting your mother it's like somebody hurting your sister it's like somebody hurting your brother and so these things are felt very deep at a visceral raw level when these kinds of conversations and processes are happening where you know these dialogues are spinning out of control into patent and commercializations when really as indigenous people we haven't had the opportunity to really sit you know to be able to think about that uh, 
uh, context because the world is suffering right now. We have a lot of trauma. We have a lot of PTSD. We have a lot of you know disconnection from Earth, from ourselves, from people that are perpetuating some of these systems of, of disruptions, and in fact, threatening ourselves as the human species. So you know we understand that too as Indigenous people, and and trying to be able to balance these things is is entirely complex. But we really haven't given the space to Indigenous people to be able to sit and explore these things in the context of the modern world you know the the conversations being dictated outside of ourselves right now i think that might be a terrific message to end on there um i want to just say a particular thank you to professor Evers and professor riley for taking the time to do this um and i'm going to send it over to leah for a final word Yes, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Professor Redvers and Professor Riley for coming and sharing uh, your perspective and knowledge and educating all of us. Um, for everyone who joined us, thank you. And we, our next seminar will be November 15th. So we hope to see you then too. Thank you. Merci, Joe. Thanks.